Okay, hi everyone. Let's get started. Yeah, as usual, let's first go through the comments quickly. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions about exer the, the exercise specifically. Uh, yeah, so some of you had problems with, well, one of you had problem with the plots and they were unsure if it was okay or not, the answer. But hopefully the teacher assistants could help you during this uh, exercise sessions. So, and of course you can always reach out. So I don't know what the problem exactly was. Uh, then there were problems with classification and with plus today we are going to talk about visualizations or maybe whatever problem you had from the exercise you will get the answer today and one some of one of you had problem with classification uh, and missing values and um, he or she uh, has tried to remove the values but still they appeared in the visualization did anyone else had the problem yeah, probably not because if you have done it correctly, it shouldn't appear anymore because you're getting rid of that in your data. So probably something is wrong. Again, you can ask teacher assistants or me later. Uh, a couple of you have had uh, very confused with merging and joining. Uh, I will go through this again next week because this is something you're going to need for your final assignment. Today we are going to work with visualization, so you won't need it for your exercise this week. But let's have a look at it again next week since a couple of you seem to have a problem with that. So we will have a look at that next week. Yeah, yeah, the next lecture. Yeah, next lecture. Yeah, so there's no lecture next week. Yeah, so we will have a look at that in two weeks. Then, uh, yeah, so a few of you had problem with that. And then one person saying that the documentations on the internet are not so clear. Uh, and that's very true, yeah. They're, they're usually very confusing if you read the documentations of like Python libraries in general or programming libraries. They are a bit complex, but the more you work with them, the more you learn how to work with it. Like today, for example, we will look at one of the documentations of like one of the libraries that we will be working with for visualization and you will see it's a bit more complex how to figure out how to use things, but it will take some time and you will eventually get used to it. Uh, yeah, so let's get started with today's uh, lecture. And yeah, we have a lot of uh, contents to cover and it's maybe one of the most interesting lectures of this whole course because you will get to make more maps, more interesting maps, so let's have so let's get it started so we have enough time to cover everything in detail. So as usual, we start from our uh, Jupyter Lab. So if you haven't pulled the latest changes, do so. I have done it already for myself. So you should have lesson five already. Yeah, and one thing to maybe I might forget at the end, so I will tell you already that I already published the instructions for the final assignment. So I will go through the details if you have time today, if not, then again in two weeks. But the instructions are quite detailed, so you can, if you want to get started with the work, you can already do that. So the contents are there. And next week we don't have exercise anymore, like next lecture. So there won't be an exercise six. So this week you will have your final exercise. Then you will have only your final assignment. But yeah, the instructions are already there. So if you want to get it started, you can do that. But yeah, so today we are going to talk about maps. Well, we have already learned how to create maps, like using this just simple plotting. So today we are going to continue with that. So we will create more static maps but we will like focus a bit more and try to add some features to our map so we can create better maps using Python. And the second part of our today's lesson, we will learn to work with, we will learn to create interactive web maps. So if you're, have, if you're publishing a website or if you want to just have an interactive map for whatever reason, today we will learn how to do that. So for doing this, we will learn to work with a couple of new libraries. So 
For example, today we will learn, so far we have created maps, but we have not really added base maps. So we will learn to do that today using a library called Contextily. So we will learn how to work with that. Then we have, uh, then we will work with another new library called Folium, which allows us to create uh, interactive web maps without writing any code in JavaScript, which is good. Uh, yeah, and then we will learn how to work with the interactive maps, for example, adding pop-ups and tooltips and such handy features. Yeah, so as I said, we have already learned how to work with static maps, so now we are just going to cover a few more details. So, yeah, so at first we will just create something similar to what we have previously created and then uh, just to refresh our memory and then we will try to add more details to that. So the data sets that we are going to work with for this first part of today's lesson are, well, one of them is this travel uh, matrix that we have worked with already a few times. So it's the travel times to Helsinki railway station, the same data we worked with last week. Uh, it is already saved on your CSC space. Then the second data set we will be working with is Helsinki Metro Network that we will retrieve from WFS, again, something that we have done before. And the third data layer we will be working with is the, the main roads of Helsinki that we will also get from uh, WFS. Okay, so, so I assume all of you have pulled the changes and you didn't have any problem. So let's get it started. So as usual, we will um, define the path to our data so we won't have problems with that during our work. So the code is there, just run it. Then we are going to get our data. So as I said, the travel matrix is there already in your data folder but we need to get the other two data layers from WFS of the city of Helsinki, the data share. So this is something we have worked with. I tried this before. We are still getting problem with the SSL certificate, so I have put the code there for you so you don't get the error. So yeah, so we are so we are we are making a connection to the WFS feature and then we are importing two data layers from there. One of them is the metro lines, and the other one is the main roads of Helsinki. So if you're wondering how you know about these data sets, which data sets are available through the WFS, well, one thing is that you check the documentation of the source of the data. So in this case, city of Helsinki data share or info share. So you check the documentation. Another handy thing, as I had I guess I mentioned earlier is QGIS. In QGIS, you can import WFS very easily, and all you need is basically this link. And from there, you can see the data clearly. So yeah, so this is the data we will be working with and also specifying the, the coordinate system for each of them. So one, so we have another line of code here where we are dealing with the, the missing data. So if you remember, we had some minus one. So we are importing a library called NumPy. And using NumPy, we are replacing the minus one with NAN, or not a number value. So it doesn't cause problem to us during the work. So let's import the data. So this is the, uh, the warning we always get. So it shouldn't cause any problem. So now we are adding several layers to our map. So once again, it's very important to have the same coordinate system. Otherwise, the maps won't, be, won't appear in the same place. So we have a line with assert. So we are checking if the coordinate system is the same across the three data sets. So let's run that. Uh, and we see that it's not the same. So what we are going to do is to to convert them, to project our 
coordinate systems to the same system so we can work with it. But first of all, let's check what coordinate systems we have and which one is the best to continue with. So let's check with the first data, which is our accessibility grid. So let's check what coordinate system we have there. So for this one, we have this Eurofin um, coordinate system, which is very commonly used in Finland. So it's a probably a good coordinate system to continue with, but let's check the other two data sets. The other one we are going to check is the metro data. So this is a different coordinate system. This is also suitable for Finland, but it's a bit like more, more for like Northern Europe. So probably we have to continue with the, it's better to continue with this Eurofin at first, but let's also check what is the coordinate system of our third data layer. So roads, it's coming from the same source. So probably it has also the same coordinate system, this 3879. So so what, as I said, it's better to continue with the first coordinate system, the Eurofin that we often work with in Finland. So let's convert, let's project the other two layers to that coordinate system. So with roads. roads dot to CRS. And we are just going to get the coordinate system of the accessibility grid. Let's do the same thing for the other data set, Metro. So now we change the coordinate system of these two data sets. So it should be matching the first one now that we had from the travel matrix. But just to be sure, let's run this code where we have the assertion, checking if the three are equal. We do not get any errors, meaning that um, now the coordinate systems are matching. So we are ready to create that ma our maps. So now we are going to plot a multi-layer map, I guess, Previously, we have worked with two layers on our map. Now we are going to have one more. Doesn't make so much difference. So now to just like refresh our memory, I will give you a few minutes to try to create this map. So this is something we have done in previous weeks. So you should remember. So there are some instructions here. So we are going to add the polygon layer and for this define some scheme, some classification that you find suitable and then apply some color map that it, you find nicer for the map. And then another parameter that we are using here for the first time is alpha that you can assign a value from zero to one and it will adjust the transparency of the layer so also apply some alpha value that you find best for your map. And then we will add the other two layers, which are the, the lines. So we have the metro line and we have the main roads and apply a different style, different color for the metro line so it doesn't get mixed up with the main roads. So one thing to think about here, like try to see if you come up with a solution, is that like, now, because we have more than one layer of data and the extents of the different layers are not the same. So your map may not look very nice. So take a few minutes and see if you can come up with a solution for that to make your map look nicer.
Okay, so did anyone manage to produce any math? So I, I slowly start to do this. Well, I just copied the code for the first part. So yeah, so we create our map. Like we define a size. This is something I've done many times. Then the, co the, co the column we want to visualize is the travel times that is called PT underscore R underscore T, some column that we have previously worked with. The scheme I've used here is quantiles. You might have used something else. And the color map I applied is spectral. You will see in the visualization, it's, it's a, it's a ni nice color ramp to use. The line widths for the polygons, I'm not using any color wi line widths. And the alpha I used is 0 0.8. And then you add this other layer, so to the same axis. So for the metro lines, I use the color orange, and I applied a bit thicker line width. And I did the same thing for the roads, just the color is different. I set it to gray, and I used thinner line. So this is the map that I got. So this is already quite good, but as I said, because we have multiple layers and the extents of them are not matching, the map looks a bit weird. So you want the map to be a bit more zoomed in around this area where we have the, the travel matrix data from. So this is something I guess we did a bit in the first period course. So what we do is basically getting the extents of the matrix and then using it as an extent of our visualization. So I will add a few more lines of code here. So I will get the minimum x, the minimum y, as well as the maximums. So using this line of code, I will get the minimum and maximum x and y. So it gives me the extent of the accessibility data. So I'm going to use this extent for my visualization. So x dot set x limit then it's mean x and max s. So these are the ranges of my X coordinates and similar for the Y coordinates. Okay, so our map now looks better. Of course, this is not a course in cartography, but we know it's not only about getting the output. So today we will see a bit, like we practice a bit how to make our maps look better. So this looks much better because we fix the extent of our map. So let's go ahead and add legend to our map. So this is something that we have done before. So let's create the visualization again. So x equals accessibility grid. The plot. I provide a size for my figure. This is something that has worked well on this page. So let's go with that. And then we specify the name of the column as usual. Let's use the same column for visualization. It was PT underscore R underscore T. So 
I set the outline to zero. I don't want outline for a map. And alpha, yes, use the same value, 0 0.8. So this is something we did before. If you want a legend in your map, you just have to, you just need to set it to true. So it takes Boolean value in, so it's true or false. Then here you can pass in uh, keywords to your legend. I will explain this a bit more soon, but now let's just go ahead and add a label to our legend. So you just write legend underline keywords. Actually it's short, it's K-W-D-S. And then here you can pass in some parameters that will be used by your legend. So one parameter that we can specify is label, which will just give a title to your legend. So let's just say travel time in minutes. Okay, so if you run this code, it gives you the visualization as well as um, legend. So one thing to notice here is like uh, when you're creating a map, if you have not specified any classification. So in this case, we have not specified anything for the scheme. So what it's going to give you is this kind of legend. So it gives you a bar. So it's actually using a different class under the library. So if you're checking for the documentation, you want to like change things about your legend, you should know that if you have not used classification, it's going to use this, this class for uh, creating, the uh, creating the legend. So let's check out the, some of the parameters that you can pass into this class to customize your uh, legend. So I will give you like a minute or two. Try to move this uh, legend to the top of your map. So one of the parameters you can pass is location. So try to bring this legend to the top. So you can add more parameters to the keywords. Let's see how we can do it. So did anyone manage to bring the, yeah. So what you need to do is just pass in another variable, and this is something you find from the uh, documentation. So documentation says that this is a parameter you can provide, and these are the values you can specify. So it can be left, right, top, bottom. So that's how you specify it. It takes them as a string, so just be careful with that. So there are other variables you can play with later. Like one thing that you can use is this string. So so try to shrink your scale bar so you can adjust the size of it. So now try it and make it half as big as it is now. See if we can do it.
Yeah, so I made it smaller. So what you just do, you provide the parameter shrink and you can just give a value to it, which is a float. And then it will just adjust the size of the, uh, the bar accordingly. So the name of the parameter you pass in should be string and then the output, uh, the value you provide, if it's a number, then it's a number. If it's a text, then you pass it as a string. Yeah, so as I said, this you will get this kind of uh, legend if you have not a specified a scheme, a classification scheme in your visual in your visualization. So let's try and see how it would work if we have a scheme in our for our visualization. So let's create the map again. So accessibility grid dot plot. I'm going to use similar values, so fixed size. Twelve and eight. So this time I'm going to provide scheme. You can choose whatever you want. I'm going to use quantiles. color map I'm going to use a spectral Pretty much the same code, so you could have just copied it. Do you see any typos, any problems in my... Oh yeah, yeah, that's true, I, speak, I skipped that line, yeah, so the column, that's true. So the column was, what was it called, PTRTT. Okay, so now we got our map and you see the uh, legend looks different now that we have a classification scheme defined for our map. So just one important thing to remember here is that it is generated using a different class. So if you are checking the documentation to see how things work, you have to just follow a different link, you know. It's created by this other class. So as you saw, we can just pass in keywords. There are like a small differences, so don't confuse the, uh, the two. So in the first one, if you wanted to provide a title for your scale bar, the parameter's name was label. In this one, the parameter's name is title. So it does the same thing, it's just different class, it's defined a bit differently. So there are, about, uh, like there are also small differences. For example, if you want to change the location of, so this is something you can see from so you can see if you want to change the location of the legend, in the first example, we use the parameter location. Here, you use the parameter loc. So it does the same job, it's just different. And then options are a bit different. So you can say upper right, upper left. Or you can also provide these values that are mentioned in the documentation. 
So just note that the, the functionality is similar, just things might be called a bit differently. So now we can take a minute and try to move the legend to the bottom right corner, see if it works for you. So you just provide the parameter with the value lower right, it will move your legend there. So same as the other one, just that it's called a bit differently. Okay, do you have any questions so far? So there are a lot of like a small things you can change about your map, your legend, the way they look. So you, you probably need to check the documentation if you want to make a small differences to see how things work. So now let's continue and add a base map. Uh, we know that we well, have made a lot of maps before. You know that base maps are. Well, you don't always have to have a base map. It depends on the kind of map and like for who you are making the map. But generally, it's a good idea in most cases to have a base map. It just makes it more understandable, and it helps the map user, map reader. Like it makes it easier for them to orient themselves around the map. So, so luckily there is a library that makes it very easy for us to use different kinds of base maps. And the library, there are a few examples of this, but the library that we will be working with, and it works very nicely with GeoPandas, is this Contextly library. So you can provide different kinds of base maps. They have a number of built-in base maps, but also you will see now that you can provide also the link, uh, proper links to different kinds of base maps that you can use. Yeah, so one thing to note is that when you are using these base maps, they usually come in this Web Mercator projection, 3857. But for example, if you are working with a data set from Finland, you, are probably, you probably have one of those local projection systems, coordinate systems. So, so be careful with, if you're adding base map, be careful with your coordinate system. So what we are, the best practice is to just convert, to, to transform your coordinate system to the same as the web one. So let's move all our coordinate system to web Mercator projection. So this is what we are doing now. Now we are going to visualize these three data sets. So we have the accessibility grid, the metro lines, and the roads, the main roads. So we are going to transform all of them to 3857, which is the same that is used in our base map. The code is there. Let's just run it. So now it should be working. So here, most of the code is there. Just one thing to add. A few things to add. One is that you have to import the library for adding the base map. So in our case, we are going to work with Contextly, as I said. So just go ahead and import the library. So the rest of the code is what we have done a few times already today. That's just creating the map and adding a legend and um, adding a label to our legend. So the other thing you have to do to add the, actually, now you imported the library you need for creating, for adding the base map. Now you have to line, write one line of code and add the base map to your map. So it's quite easy. So you just use contextly dot add base map. So normally it should work if, if you do not provide the source, it should work, but I tried earlier today and it wasn't working for some reason. So just to be safe, let's provide the source we are of, of our base map. 
You can also try it without to see if it works for you. By default, it should use OpenStreetMap or something. It didn't work for me, so let's specify the source, and the source is contextually. I will explain how to choose the source. Dot providers. Dot open street map. Dot mapnik. So this is our map, we have a base map. So one thing is that now you're getting the base map from the internet, so sometimes they don't work if there's something wrong with the provider or if something changes in the syntax, then you might have a problem. But there is a long list of providers available to us, so you can just try and see which one works. So now this is open a street map, you can see it's nicely loaded and it's behind our layers. So if you want to see what kind of base maps are available to you to choose from, of course you can go to the documentation and there is a list of the service providers. So some of them have more than one base map you can use. So for example, in this case, OpenStreetMap has several to choose from. So in this case, this is how the syntax works. So it's contextually dot providers dot open street map because open street map have more than one option to choose from then it's again dot then you choose the type that you want to work with. So in this case we use mapnik. So you could try and use another one from here. So another way of course you can always check their documentation to see what providers are like readily available to you but of course you can also run, run this one line of code, contextly.providers, and it should give you the same list, a list of providers that are available to you. Yeah, so you can choose basically any base map for your map. So another thing you can do, like now, if it is a provider that is built in contextually, you can just provide the name. But another thing you can do is to save the URL. So if you're getting in the internet, some, you, from some source you got a base map, so you have the X, Y, Z tiles, you can just provide the link to it. It is also useful because for some of these, uh, for many of these you don't need anything, you just provide the link and it works. But for example, you can see for the map tiler, for this map, you also need to provide a key. So for many of these, you need to have an account and create some kind of token or API key to work with. So if you will need to provide an API key, then you should provide the link. So instead of writing the name of it, you just provide the URL, and in the URL, you type in the key that you want to use. because. Here, there is no parameter for providing a token or a key. So if you are using a service that requires a key, just provide the link. Then you can put the key in the link. Is it clear so far? Do you have any questions? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Take a minute to try with one of them, and then I will show you how it works. See if you can get it working. Try something that doesn't require a key because then you have to just go and sign up and get a 
API key. Did you get it? Did you manage to get it work? So, yeah. So in this list of providers, you see there is always a URL that you can use. You just basically copy the URL, then you can pass it in directly. Or in my case, I just stored it in one variable, which I call base map or BM for short. Then you just instead of source, instead of providing the name, you just pass in the link. So just note that the link should be provided as a string, so it should be in quotation mark. So in this case, it's the same map we have. It's OpenStreetMap MapNIC, so I just use the link instead. Okay, so now let's continue and like work a bit with our data. So to see the details of the base map, you know OpenStreetMap which we used here has a lot of details on the map, but now the map is very zoomed out. So let's make a selection from our data so we can zoom in a little bit more. So the code is already there. What we are going to do is to only, only use the grid cells that are within 15 minute distance or travel time from the central railway station. So we are making a query based on that. So getting all the sales that are less than 15 minutes. And the rest is the same. So this is something we have done many times. We are classifying the data using quantiles and we are, we are asking for five classes. And there is nothing new here. So let's just go ahead and run this piece of code to get our map. So now if you now that we zoomed in a bit you can see more details. So one thing that is often required it is even like uh, for some of depends on what source of base map you're using for many of them it's it's not obligatory to use attributions. Attribution means that you are using someone's service the base map open a street map you should give them credit like you should acknowledge them somewhere. For OpenStreetMap, for example, we didn't do that thing, and it didn't complain. For some of them, that if you try many of the base maps, they will force you to add attribution to your map. So adding attribution to your map is quite simple. So it's just one parameter when you're adding the base map contextually dot add base map you can just put the attribution and just write whatever text you are using in our case we are using open street map so we added it to our attribution and also the data the travel times come from digital geography lab here so we add it to our acknowledgement so let's just run this code so by default it's going to add Add it just here, 
And I was doing a bit of research. There is no easy way of moving this. This is the standard. So if you want to use attribution and put it somewhere else, it's just easier probably to add text to your plot and put it wherever you want. But if you want to go with the built-in function, it's just going to appear there. Yeah, so this is an aesthetic map. This is like, we have already seen how we can save the map. So if you want to save it, you can just save it like we did in the first course. So try to save it, see if you have any problem with that. So if you want to save it, you have to import that library that we have worked with a lot in the first period. And I guess, again, the second period, that pyplot, matplot, leap.pyplot, and then you use the plt.savefig to save the file. Yeah, so if you want to save your map, just remember that you have to import this library we have worked with before, matplotlib.pyplot as plt, if you want to make it shorter. And then you just write plt.savefig, and then you provide the path to your file. In this case, I'm just saving it next to my script as my map.png. And if you refresh this folder, you will see that my map has appeared there. Yeah, so this is a static map. You can just export it as an image, use it on a website, on your report, wherever. But it's not interactive. So what we are going to try to do in the second part of the lecture today is to map the, make the map a bit more interactive. So let's open the second notebook for today, interactive maps. So you probably know that almost anything interactive on the internet is written with JavaScript, and that applies to maps as well. So if you see maps that are interactive, they have been written with JavaScript probably. So there are a number of libraries that, are, that make it easy for us to make interactive maps on the internet, like Leaflet is one of the famous ones, also open layers. So you might have worked with some of these before in your courses. Yeah, but now we are working with Python, so we don't need to, luckily we do not need to use JavaScript, so there are libraries that allow us to use features of this without writing any code in JavaScript. So now we are going to work with Leaflet, and there is a good library called Folium that allows us to work with Leaflet without writing any code in JavaScript. So now we are going to work with this and create some interactive map. So compared to what we have done before with just geopandas and plotting, this is a bit more complex, not complex, but a bit more confusing because it's originally coming from JavaScript, so it's a bit different, the logic. But we will see that it's not difficult, it's just, you just need to get used to it. So let's uh, set our, where, like, Let's set our path as usual. Here you can see we have an extra line of code that maybe we haven't used before. 
and it is this mk there or make directory so it what it just does we need a folder here called html we are going to save our map later as html and for that we are creating a folder so what this does it creates the folder for you so let's just run this so you see as soon as i ran this code it created a folder called html here there is a variable we passed in called exist ok and we have set it to true if it is true and if the folder already exists and you run the code you're not going to run into any error but if this was false and i ran this piece of code it would have complained that the folder already exists so if let's try so it's telling me that this folder already exists so just to make sure that we don't get any errors if the folder is already there i'm going to pass in this variable and set it to true Okay, so now we are going to get started and make our first interactive map. To keep it simple at first, we just add a base map and nothing else to see how Folium works. So of course, to start working with Folium, we need to import the library. It's called Folium without any capital letters. So we are going to create a map and call it interactive map. So the syntax we need for creating a map with Folium is just folium.map and the map is with the, the first letter is capital. So one parameter you need to provide is the location. So it just basically tells the map where should be the center. So you should just provide the coordinates. So in this case, I just found the coordinates somewhere in uh, Helsinki. So it's 60.2 and 24.8. So this is where your map will be centered. So the second par parameter we are going to provide is the zoom start. So what will be the initial zoom level when the map loads for the first time? Of course, it's interactive, so the user can adjust the zoom level. But this is what where it starts from. So I'm going to provide 10. So this is something it should work with, like with trial and error, see which one works best. 10 seems to be working well here. Then if you want to add a scale bar to your map, you need to set this variable, this parameter to true, control scale. So we are just going to set it as true. So this is going to add a scale bar to our map and then in order to see our map let's just write its name interactive map and then the jupyter lab should show it to us yeah so this is a ma our map it's interactive it has very minimum things now we can just zoom in and zoom out. So that's the level of interaction we have for now. And it has nothing else. It's just a base map. So if you want to save the map in HTML, if you want to like use it somewhere else later, it's easy to save it as HTML. So you just write the name of your map, interactive map. Then you're going to save it. And then you provide the path to your file so we want to save it in this html folder that we created earlier and it was called something like this html directory and then i'm going to call it basemap.html so the format will be html So if you run this, it's going to create an HTML file in your HTML folder. So you can view it in, for example, your browser to see how it looks like. So now we did not provide any base map, but by default, it just loaded OpenStreetMap. So with 
Folium, if you do not provide the base map name explicitly, it's just gonna, going to use OpenStreetMap. But what if we want to use another base map? So let's create our map again. You can just copy the text from before. So if you want to provide the name of the base map you want to use, you just have to pass in the name of the base map provider as tiles. So in this case, I'm going to use a map called So it's called Carto DB Positron, if I've typed correctly. And then I just put the name of the map there so we get the view of it. Yeah, so now we see we have a different base map. So what you do basically do is just provide the name. So here there is a link to the documentation. You can see, for example, what other base maps are available to you. So like we saw in the last part, if you want to, so there are just a few providers that are built in. You can just provide their name and you get it. But of course, if you want to get your base map from somewhere else, here also you can get get it from a link. I will just copy it from the course's website so I don't have to type it. Yeah, so instead of tiles, you either provide the name of the provider that is built in in the folium, or you can just provide a link, then X, Y, Z tile. So this I just found from the internet. So for Google Maps, this is the link. So if you do a bit of research, you can find these links. And we also saw these links in the first part of the course. So you can s use any of those links. So I'm just going to copy this. So, it's, it's, so basically everything else is the same. I just have uh, another parameter I'm passing in here is this attribute. So it's going to uh, add the attribution to the map. So I will just copy this from the course's website and I will use it here. So now it, gave, uh, it, provide, it made us a map, and the Google Maps is the base map. So Google Maps was not built in, but we just provided the X, Y, Z tiles, and we got it to our map. Okay, so in this case, it was easy. We just made a basic interactive map with a base map. Usually, this is not enough. If you're adding an interactive map to your website, for example, you probably want to show something other than the base map. So now we see how we can add data to our map. We start with something very easy. So imagine if you just have one point, you want to, for example, share the location of your home or some point of interest with, with whoever is looking at your map. So, so let's create our map again. So again, I call it interactive map. And I will use folium to create my map. So I'm repeating a lot of code here. So you can also copy it from earlier if you want. So the location is 6.60.2. I guess it's somewhere around Gompola.
So now I'm going to add a marker of Kumpula. I just got it from Google Maps earlier. So you just create a new variable. In this case, I'm going to call it Kumpula. And then I'm going to add volume dot marker. And then you provide the location of the marker you want to put on the map. So you get the coordinates from somewhere. So I already have the coordinates for Kumpula, somewhere in Kumpula, so 60.204 and 24.962. So this will be the location of my marker. I also want to add a tooltip. So tooltip is this, when you hover on the feature, it will show a temporary pop-up where it shows you something. So later we will see how we can read. If you have many points, it will be read from the data, but now we have just one point I'm going to pass in the value of the tooltip as a string. So tooltip equals, I, you can just write what you want, I'm on block campus. Then you need to provide some icon for the point, so there are a bunch of built-in uh, colors and icons that you can use. You can check them in the doc in the documentation. So I'm going to set the color as green. And as I said for icons you can get there are a lot of these icons built in in the documentation. You can check the name of them. This is just one that looks okay. So this one is called OK-Sign. I believe you can also provide a link here for icon. So if you get a nice icon that is somewhere on some website, if you're allowed to use it, then you can just get the link and put it here. Then what we need to do, we just add it to our map. So kumpula.add2.add underscore two. And we are going to add it to our interactive map. Just copy the name. And then I'm going to write the name of the map here so I can get an overview of it. So if I don't have any typo, it should work. Yeah. So this is tooltip. So if I just go on top of the point on the marker, it's going to show me Kumpula Campus. This, this is the text that I wrote here. So now we added some data, we made the map a bit more at, uh, interactive. So we have this, this tooltip, this kind of pop-up that is added to our map. So now we are going to, so this is rarely the case that you make a map and you add one point. You probably have some data and you want to visualize your data. So now we will see how we can add our data to the map. So the data that we are going to add to our map is the address data that we used, was it two weeks ago? We are going to use that. So the code, is, I just copied from the website. So I don't have to type everything. So I import GeoPandas and I read this file, this addresses file that we have worked with before. And I use the dot head function to have a look at our data to see how it looks like. So this is the data you have seen before. So now we want to use this data to create our interactive map. So instead of typing just the coordinates for one location, we are going to use this data. So we call it again interactive map. And again, we are going to create a volume map object. Again, providing the location, the center of the map. I will use the same location as before. Then 
starting zoom will be 12. So now I'm going to add the, the layer, the data we have to our map. So it was called addresses, I guess, and underscore layer. And I'm going to use folium dot features dot geo json Okay, so for adding, uh, well, as I said before, this is b built based on leaflet. So leaflet works with JavaScript, and in the world of internet, the most common type of geographic data format is GeoJSON. So that's why we use this name. So, but what this library does for us is that we don't have to convert our data. So our data is in GeoPanda format, but uh, and leaflet works with GeoJSON, but it will be taken care of. So although the function looks like this, features.geoJSON, but we provided our variable, our data uh, as GeoPandas, so addresses, the data we had. Then we added some name for our layer. If you want to, you can add that, and that's it. So one thing I actually missed was adding the map to, adding it to my map, so addresses underscore layer add to layer dot add to then you add it to your map I have a typo here, it's features with E. Yeah, so now we loaded our bus stop addresses, like the data we had and we worked with before. Yeah, so you can easily work with GeoPandas. You don't have to convert, to your, uh, convert your data to any other format. So one thing I'm going to add to our map to make it a little bit more interactive is a pop-up. I just copied this code from the website, so you can do the same from the course's website. So we are creating the same map. The only difference here is that we create a pop-up object here and we define how the pop-up should work. So for that, you just give a name to your pop-up and then you use folium.geojson pop-up and the P is capital, then you name the fields that you want to appear in your pop-up, and then if they have another name that, for example, address in our case is with a small letter, I want it to look like, um, start with the capital letters, so you can just add it as the alias name. Then localize, because this is web-based, you know that many browsers know, for example, if you have always opened a website uh, like automatically if you open Google from Finland or from your browser and in your browser settings the language is Finnish, it will automatically appear to Finnish to you by default. So if you add this localized true, it will try to localize the data. So depending on where your data comes from, it might, uh, it might change the data format and language to make it match the place. Then if you add labels as true, it's going to add the name of the column that you're using in the pop-up. I will run this soon, you will see the output, then it will make more sense. And then you can add some style to it. And then the rest is the same, we just added the layer. But just one thing you need to remember, if you have created a pop-up ob object, later we will see this also with tooltip, 
You just need to pass it in here. So popup equals popup. Then it knows that you have created a popup object and it will be added to your map. So I will just run this. So the map is created. And now if I click on any of the <coughs> points, I'm going to get this popup and this is the alias name and the value is just the address that was read from the column. So now our map got even a bit more interactive. We could add a pop-up to our map. So now we worked with points. Let's also see how we can create a nice map with, uh, with polygons. So we have to import our data and we are going to get it from WFS. So let's just copy it from the co course's website so we don't have to type everything. So the data we are going to work with is this population grid from Helsinki that we have worked with before. Let's just get the data. And this is what it looks like. So let's do a bit of data cleaning quickly. So we, there are many columns here that we are not going to work with. So let's just keep the ones we need and uh, rename them to the English name. So population grid. So the only columns I want to keep is index. I'm going to rename my columns to English. So population underscore grid equals that rename. And for that, you probably remember, we just provide a new dictionary with the new and old name. The column equals Yeah, so now we we got rid of the columns we did not need and we translated one column to English, to population. So now we are going to, of course, we, we saw one way of adding layers to our map, which was using this feature GeoJSON. So now for polygons, we can also create cropless map, which is, it makes things a bit easier for us. So you can, of course, do it. You don't have to use this, but this makes an already nice looking map that you know, it makes the steps you take for creating a nice map a bit shorter. So now we are going to use a different function called volume.corpless to create our map. So this can be a little bit confusing, but it's not difficult. So what it does is, so I will show the code from the website. Yeah, so it assumes that you have two data sets. One of them is a, where you have the geometries, then you have the other one, the, another data set which has your attribute data. In our case, it's not, it's not like that. We just have one data set if you have the attributes and the geometry in the same. 
So we just provide the same for each of them. So we will see in the example now, I will go and show you the code. That's one thing. So you provide two, two data names. So geodata is the data where you have the geometry and the data where you have the attributes. In our case, it's the same. So we provide the same data for each of them, to both of them. So that's one thing. The other thing it needs is one column because it assumes that you have two separate data, it needs to have a column based on which it can perform a join. So it will join the data for you. And that column has to be a string. So in our case, we need to add a new column that is string. Based on that, it will do the join. For us, it's unnecessary because it's not two data sets, but that's anyway how it works. So one easy way of creating a new column to use as our index is to just use the index value and just convert it to a string. So let's just do that so Folium is happy with us. So what we just did is use the ID field that was already in the data. Uh, we used the index, we created a new field called ID and we used the index value. We just converted it to a string because Folium needs string. So I will just uh, copy the code so I have more time to explain it. So what we are doing now is to create the interactive map again. So nothing is different here. Adding the location, the zoom start level. And then what we are doing, we are creating this population grid um, layer. And this time we use a different function. So we are using Folium Cropless. So as I said, we provide two data sets. One of them is GeoData. It's population grid, and our data is also population grid. So in our case, we just have one data where everything is in the same file, in the same data. But if it was separate, it just does the join for you. And then the columns. The column, this is a tuple. So the column, the first one is the field that you just created, ID. So it's the field it will use for joining. And the second column is the, sec the column that is going to use for visualization. And then you have key on. This is the column in your other data. And then again, it's just feature.id. ID is the name of the column you created. And the feature comes from GeoJSON, because in GeoJSON, you should, that's how it works. So just ignore that feature.id. ID is the field you just created. Does it make sense? For us, it, this is very unnecessary, so it might be confusing because everything is in one file, but imagine if you're getting your points from WFS somewhere and you want to just attach some attributes to it and add it to your map, then it's kind of handy that it just does the join for you so you don't have to do the join yourself. But in our case, it's just all in one file, so it looks unnecessary. And this ID field is, you're doing a join, so you need to have a common field and Folium wants it to be string. That's why we clear, created a new column, which is a string. Yeah, so, so as you can see, we didn't add any information about the style, like what color we want or many of the things, but it just created a very quick map for us. So if you just want to qu quickly create a map, this coreplus core function does, just does it easy for you. But of course, you may not be happy with the defaults. So in this case, for example, these outlines are very ugly. So you may want to get rid of it. So that's what we are going to do now. So again, I copy the code because it's a lot of code and we don't have so much time. So most of this code is the same as we had. So we are providing, we create the map, we provide the ID fields and the data. So this is not changed. So what we are specifying here, so if you don't specify this, it will just do something by default. 
We didn't like the output, so we are making changes. So now we are providing the number of bins, so the classification. Remember, with the other library we worked with, it was k for classification. Here it's nine, it's bin. So we are providing the value nine. So we have nine classes. The field color, we didn't like this blue color. It was very ugly, so I'm going to change the color to this one. So you just call it, the parameter is called field color. Then you provide one of those values that we have worked with before. You can specify the line weight. So I don't want the polygons to have outline, so I will just put it to zero. And then you can provide a name for your legend. I'm kind of calling it population 2020. And that's it. You just run the code. So it just creates some map for you by default. But if you are unhappy with it, you just can override some of the values, like number of class and the colors used. So the map looks a bit better. Note that here there is one parameter highlight. True. So this is another interactive thing you can add to your map. So if you just go on your polygons, it's going to highlight them like this. So if you just set highlight to true, you will get this kind of feature to your map. So now as one last thing, we want to add a tooltip to our map. So remember tooltip, but that kind of pop-up that doesn't stay. If you just hover or over a polygon or over a feature, it will show. So it was quite easy. Earlier we used that GeoJSON feature. For that, it was easy to add a tooltip. But now we are using Cropless. So with that one, it's a bit more difficult. So we are doing a trick. So we are putting a GeoJSON layer on top of our map. And we are making it transparent so it doesn't show. But then we add tooltip to that one. So. So one reason it's good to use the Coropless function is that when you are using the JSON adding, like this one, this GeoJSON, you have to specify the style. So it's a bit more difficult. Like with Coropless, it was very nice and easy. You just say, OK, this is my beans, this is field color, this is line weight. But if you are using GeoJSON, then you have to define a function and specify the style. But anyway, now we have created our map already. I just want to add one GeoJSON on top of it and make it transparent so it's invisible. I just use this to get the tooltip because, as I said, with Coropless, you cannot get tooltip so easily. So yeah, so before you remember, we created a pop-up pop -up object to create a pop-up. Now we create a tooltip object using folium.features geojson tooltip. And then you say that in your tooltip, you want to use this field, population. And if you have another name for it, you can provide it. And then when you create your map, you just remember to add tooltip equals tooltip. So it knows that you have created a tooltip object and you want to add it to your map. So now if we run the code, it should work. So this is what we got. So now the background is the map we had here. So this is the same map. So we just added one invisible vector on top using which we created this tooltip. So it's just a trick we applied to get this tooltip working with Coropleth map. So if you just go over different polygons, it's going to show you the population value. Yeah, and that was it. I know it was a lot of content, but it was all important. But it's a lot to like process, but then again, it's not so complicated. It's just syntax, because the map making process is just something you have done before in QGIS in different software. It's just basically learning the syntax, how to do it in Python using these libraries. Yeah, if you don't have any questions, then I will just quickly show you the exercise for next week. So exercise for next week is quite not simple, but you have a lot of freedom how to do things. So it's basically creating visualization. So you have you are given some ideas. OK. 
Yeah, so you're just given, we have two problems to solve. They're just basically making different kinds of visualizations. Then we have given you some topic and some criteria which will hopefully guide you toward like getting the full score from the exercise and doing everything. And then once you're done, you just export your map and that's it. So it's quite simple. And as I said, the assignment is already there. I will go through the final assignment, not next week, but the week after, in our le next lecture. But you can already look at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Do you have any questions from today? Yeah, it's, it's a different function we are using. It's choropless, so, so things are different, called differently, you just need to remember. Yeah. Yeah, okay, have a good evening. See you in two weeks. Next week there is no class. So we have only one lecture left, and then we will work with OpenStreetMap a bit.